Hi Brian. I'm Dick Flash from Pork Magazine. We've got a new series we're running called Talk to Pork and we're sort of interviewing a different megastar each week. And this week you've got a new record out, Milk Crate on a Small Sea. Um, actually it's um, Small Craft. I'm going to start with a few questions about your music and your approach to music. Well, I was going to ask you whether you thought technology had affected music very deeply, but then I thought, well, that's a bloody stupid question to ask Brian Eno. I know you'll agree that you just can't imagine modern music without all the technology which goes into making it and getting it heard. How do you think that process has affected what you're doing? Well, I mean, when you're making music, what eventually comes out has almost nothing to do with performance at all. I mean, I wonder if you sometimes feel more like a painter than a composer. The thing about this new record... Because after all, your music is basically scenic. It's not only that you make it more like a painter the composer, but also it doesn't have a narrative. There's no sort of teleological structure to it. It's not goal-directed. Instead, it's a bit like a sort of emotional microclimate, a place more than an event. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, I see. I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, but the real question is, should this stuff be called music at all, or is it a new art form? Do you think that this and other media suffer from the carryover of their original names when in fact they've changed into something completely different? Well, I like painting, yeah, I, I really like it. Um, I've had an exhibition at Eastbourne, actually, um, of my own pictures. Oh yeah, lovely. Um, painting, I think it's like jazz, you know, it's just, you sort of just go where it takes you without any rules, like, you mm. know. Um, but anyway, you, you said something about media. Well, you know that thing McLaren said, um, the media is the message. You mean McLuhan? No, no, no. The bloke who started the Sex Pistols. Oh, oh sorry. I see. Yeah, yeah. Amazing guitar sound. Pity about Sid, really, but he did it his way, didn't he? In your interviews, you, you talk about films and film music all the time. What's the big attraction? I mean, this new album, it's all about films, isn't it? And several of your others, Apollo music for films. How does that get started and what's it all about? Well, Because really, when you're presenting an album of music which is supposed to be film music, you're really presenting something unfinished, aren't you? I mean, the centre of the project, the film, isn't there. So the music exists like a sort of provocation to the listener's imagination, a way of saying, hey, what's the scene that this music goes with? Kind of a musical waiting for Godot. Courageous stuff, you know. Edgy. Uh, no, no, Edge isn't on this one, no. Um, great guitar sound though. Amazing. Great. Amazing. Lovely guy too. I mean, wears his hat all the time. It's sort of like a religion for him. Speaking of religion, have you read Kurt von Pork's book, Vestiges of the Religious Experience in the Artistic Spectrum? The basic idea is that aspects of the religious experience have been sort of taken over within the arts. You know, it's like art is religion for people who don't believe in God, I think. He's basically saying that humans have an appetite for something that he calls surrender. And he says that all human cultures have that appetite and they satisfy it in the same way. Sex, intoxication, art, religion. Yeah, yeah. Like sex and drugs and rock and roll, really, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I used to love that Ian Dury. Great voice. Amazing limp. Well, yes. So anyway, he says that one of the main jobs of the artist is to provide a space, a psychic space, if you like, where they can let go of the control element of their beings, just for a little while. Sort of like getting out of it. <laughs> yeah. Von Pork also says that the stance of surrender is really the counterbalance to the stance of control. He says that as a species, we're much too involved in the control aspect. We spend too much time in that side of our brain. If you want to observe the world holistically, you have to be inside it and not outside of it, trying to control it. So it's, it's a kind of ecological position, really. Art as a way of becoming integrated with things. I mean, does that ring a bell with you? Well, yeah, I mean, I love ecology. I'm, I'm, I'm so into it. I, I read about it all the time. I knew you would. <laughs> I knew you would. It's obvious from your music that you care about the planet. But, you know, you've been in the business for decades now. You must have seen a whole lot of changes in all that time. Is music really different now from when you got started in the 1930s? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the music's changed totally. 
totally. I mean, D minors, for example, we never used to use D minors. Hated them, hated them. Couldn't get into it at all. And the haircuts, you know, totally different now. I mean, look at Annie Lennox. Up and down like a bride's skirt. Red, white, silver. You never know what she's going to be next. You can light a bloody disco with her. Lovely girl with a fabulous neck. And I mean, the business, you know, the internet and all that, that must have changed everything. You know, music, you could say, has gone through another evolution. It comes out of the net like uh, for free. You don't pay for it anymore. It's, it's like water turning on a tap. I'd like to remind you that it's an offence under the 1956 Copyright Act to copy or distribute music or recordings for profit or to avoid due and proper payment in accordance with Schedule 14 of the 1911 Copyright Provisions Act. Provided there's a person commissioning the making of a sound recording who pays or agrees to pay for it in money or money's worth and the recording is made in pursuance of that commission, that person, in the absence of any agreement to the contrary, shall, subject to the provisions of Part 4 of the Act, be entitled to the copyright subsisting in the recording by the terms of the Act. But, you know, I'm cool about it really, you know. It's no big deal as far as I'm concerned. We had this thing a few weeks ago, there was a 13-year-old kid. We found out he was downloading our, some stuff of mine and, of course, the legal people, as they always do, immediately wanted to take it into court. And I said, hold on, hold on, let's chill out a little bit, shall we? This is just going over the top. And in the end, we just sent one of the roadies round and smashed his bike up. Oh, that's very thoughtful. I mean, he must have been relieved, you know, no criminal record and all that. Well, yes and no. Unfortunately, he was still on the bike. Anyway. You know, the law's the law, and I, I got Jane to send a photo to the hospital. Signed it. Just to get back to music, um, you've been a very active collaborator throughout your career. Devo, Talking Heads, Bowie, Harold Budd, John Hassel, U2, Coldplay, the list goes on and on and on and on. Gavin Bryars, Phil Collins, Tommy Steele, Al McCogan, Petula Clark. Now on this record, you're working with um, Leo Abrahams and John Hopkins, young guys, but something special about them, you know, they're the kind of guys who 40 years ago such musicians couldn't have been imagined really. They deal with instruments in a, a completely post-electronic way. Um, there's no borderline for them between real and virtual or between musicianship and sonic craftsmanship. And I suppose in some ways you could say that this, this is a movement that you helped to start all those decades ago. The, the idea of sound being in itself the material of composition, not subservient to melody and chord structure and rhythmic structure. And so I guess that's probably why you're collaborating with these guys. That position is natural to them. You can hear on the record there's a liveness and a sense of performance that we don't hear on a lot of your earlier records. But I have a theory about why you like collaborating with other people. My guess is that the other person makes it harder for you to control the situation. They act like a sort of randomizer. They throw a spanner in the works. You have to surrender to that. See, I think the thing about you, you can't stop being a producer. You love playing with what somebody else is playing as much as you enjoy playing with yourself. 